Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to USTA Florida's Here to Serve podcast. My name is Laura Bowen, and I'm the Executive Director at USTA Florida. It's March 29th, and we're going to close out Women's History Month by kicking off our Women in Tennis Initiative. And I couldn't ask for two better guests than these wonderful women leaders that I have joining me today. First up is a familiar face, Ms. Dana Andrews, who is our USTA Florida immediate past president and board member. Thank you for joining us, Dana. Thank you, Laura. And joining Dana and me today, I have Mason Kathy Brady. Mason is the executive director of the Positive Coaching Alliance, Tampa Bay. Welcome to the podcast, Mason. Thank you, Laura. Good to be with you, Dana. Good to be with you. So Dana and Mason, thank you both for joining me today. Uh, before we dive into our topic, which is women in tennis and sports, I wanted to take just a moment to have each of you share your own perspective and background in sport. And Mason, since you are new to our podcast here, how about we start with you? How did you first get introduced to sports and how did it bring you to your current role at the Positive Coaching Alliance? Sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, I am the youngest girl in the family. Uh, I've got two older brothers and my older brother, Tyler, in particular, who I'm in age closest to, was always doing sports. And so as the baby of the family and the kid that just got, you know, pulled along to whatever was happening, I found myself at you know, any and every soccer game, baseball game, uh, any, any field kind of in the, uh, in the area. And so I started playing, loved it. I'm naturally very competitive. Um, and so, you know, from a young age was always trying to either hold my own or even, you know, beat my brother. Um, so I got introduced young, um, into team sports. I've got a neighbor just down the road who, you know, when I was a young girl, uh, she was a professional triathlete and my mom said, go knock on her door. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think I was probably 10 years old and I went and knocked on this lady's door and I said, will you please teach me how to run? Oh. And, uh, at, at that age, um, she went on three mile runs with me and, um, she, the amount that she gave back and kind of just brought me along was really inspiring. Um, my husband introduced me to tennis just a number of years ago, but um, sports has been something I've always loved. I've learned so much through sport. Um, I've met and, you know, had incredible opportunities through sport. Uh, and then I got started at Positive Coaching Alliance maybe seven years ago. I was uh, helping volunteer coach at Tampa Prep um, here in the Tampa Bay area and got introduced to the athletic director who knew of the organization and said, I think you would really like this nonprofit. Uh, and I checked it out and I've been involved since. Excellent. Well, we're grateful to your husband for introducing you to tennis, <laughs> grateful for, to your neighbor for introducing you to running and sports, and certainly grateful that you ended up at the Positive Coaching Alliance. So thank you for sharing your story. Yep. So Dana, I know you've shared your story with a lot of us about how you were introduced to tennis, but would you share again, maybe for our new listeners and how about we talk a little bit about how important tennis has been in your success as a businesswoman and leader? Well, thank you, Laura. Yeah, um, as far as my path to tennis, you know, I can share on and on about that. My dad was the one who introduced me to the sport and introduced me to it on the public courts and uh, in Pittsburgh, also in Tampa, and then ended up in Jacksonville. And um he was wise enough, though, to know he shouldn't be my coach. And, and so we have a great relationship still, probably because of that. But yes, I mean, it's been in our family and his father taught him and then he introduced it to me. But in terms of tennis in general, uh, I love to share with people two things, that tennis is the best medicine. And you're going to be hearing more and more of that from USTA National in terms of the health and wellness of the sport. But for me, I also like to share that it's the sport that builds character. And I often share with people, you know, they're like, why are you involved with, you know, the grievance committee at the national level? And <laughs> I don't see that committee as something that is a hammer 
I see it as something that we can really use it as a tool to help some of the younger players and the importance of their character on and off the court. And so for me, you know, certainly just like Mason with her sport of running, you know, you learn hard work. You learn how to deal with stress. Uh, you learn how to win gracefully and how to lose gracefully. Uh, the fairness of the sport. I always say, you know, people will say, well, how many referees do you have on the courts at the junior tournaments? And I said, very few. And so think about a 12 year old in a tight match and the ball's landing, landing close to the line. How do they call it? You know, mm -hmm. to me, those types of skill sets to get them at such a young age, hard work, fairness, discipline, grace, empathy, you then take those and move them farther down the path into a business world. I can guarantee you that child who now is in their 20s looking for a job and continuing to move up the ladder. They, they do have a skill set far and above some of their peers. And I do believe that not only does it come from tennis, but I do believe that it comes from sport in general. And I've had an opportunity to share that with my child. She's now in the business world. And as she rolled her eyes at me, you know, 14 <laughs> to 18, uh, guess what? She's now saying, Mom, you were right. And when she's in a manager role and somebody's like, wah, wah, do I really have to work that hard? <laughs> she's like, uh, yeah, you do. Um, so for me, I, I probably went on too long, but I, I really do feel that down to my core that sport can impact a child, a teenager, a young adult in that way. So and awesome. Laura, Laura, can I respond to that yes, for a quick please. second? Dude. Um, so one thing that I've really enjoyed about tennis as well is, you know, learning it's a game of invitation, right? And so I'm not really going to go out there except maybe practice serves on my own or go to the ball machine, but, um, it's an opportunity to really know somebody else and, and work with somebody else. Um, and so I've learned that, uh, which is a little bit different than running, right? I can just yeah. go out and do that each morning on my own. Um, but it's been interesting. I've always been involved in sport, as I said, since I was a young girl and, you know, ran on the track team, the cross country team, played basketball, but I took running pretty far. I took it to the professional level and you can go and do races and still do very, very well and finish fourth and have maybe your best time or qualify for the next event. Um, but you didn't win. And it's been interesting to, uh, the, in the last few years, start playing tennis and it's simply, you know, there's doubles, but it's simply me versus you. Mm -hmm. And you are standing there on the court by yourself and you might be, you know, down significantly. Um, and you've got to still kind of play that out and, and you maybe you're not as good as the other player and you're still playing to the end, but it's just been different in the one-on-one -on -one aspect Whereas running oftentimes is kind of you versus the field. You know, you can imagine a road race. You might finish 18th uh, out of 350 people, but in tennis, it's one-on-one. -on -one. And so that's been some new life lessons, um, you know, and character development for me as well. That's great. That's great perspective. Thank you. All right. Well, our topic today, which we've already kind of gotten into, is women in sports. And more particularly, the work that we need to do to get more women engaged in all areas of tennis. So, Dana, I'm going to come back to you for a minute here. Can you talk a little bit about the work that USTA Florida has done in this area? And what are some of those main gaps that we've observed when it comes to how women are maybe represented in tennis? You know, I think this is a very interesting question because, Laura, you and I have talked about it some that on the pro level, you know, the leaders that we have in tennis, it's it's amazing. I mean, you have to start with Billie Jean King, you know, the Williams sisters, the examples that they were of their character, not just their skill set. Um, you have Co somebody like Coco Golf coming up. I would be remiss not to mention Danielle Collins from the St. Pete area, who's a graduate of the University of Virginia 
and um, and is doing extremely well on the pro tour. So I think for USTA Florida, we're seeing that up at this level, we have these fabulous examples and leaders, but it's not translating, at least from what we can tell, down to the community level. And so what can we do about that? And there are a few things we've started, which one of them being the community coaching initiative, which has now moved into the operations of USTA Florida. And we're really looking um, at that. It's It's been a success as far as introducing being a coach to all types of people, all walks, all ages, um, but really looking at this year, moving into doing some that are specifically just for women. And I, and I think that that is a wise initiative because again, something about women being together, not so intimidated by, you know, Hey, am I flubbing up or not? Um, the other part um, has been our speakers forum that we realized that here you can go to conferences, but if you don't see that person who looks like you standing up there, maybe telling their story, it's just not going to resonate. And so we do have a speakers forum list and we make it available to other um, organizations that if they're looking for a speaker, come to us. We may be able to match it up for you. And what I love is, Laura, you know, you coming back from the PTR conference and realizing, hey, we could even take that speakers forum a step further and and work a workshop. For women, you know, it, it, speaking in front of people may not be as natural for some as it is for others. And, and that's something that we're looking to start this year. And I guess the fourth concrete thing for me is that we did go to the board recently and we asked for funding to do actual research in this space. And we recently had our first meeting with the organization that's going to be working with us on that. And again, I'm so proud of the board that as you and I have learned through the little steps that we've done so far, you can have in your mind what you think is the problem, but really and truly you need to dig a lot deeper. And so I think that is going to help us moving forward as well in terms of what USTA Florida can do in this space. That was such a great overview, and I'm really excited about the research that we're going to be doing here in this space, and more to come on that for sure. We'll probably have a podcast on that later <laughs> this year. <laughs> so, um, Mason, you know, you've been an elite athlete, um, a coach, and you are also a business leader. Where do you see areas of improvement in terms of women being represented in sport? And where do you see the opportunities for us to do better? Um, you know, I think what Dana was just talking about touches on a few of those items. You know, she's talking about doing some research and, you know, four intentional points of how to go about some of these initiatives and just saying like, this is going to be one of our focus areas and then speaking about it so that people know um, and then they can join along. Um, you know, for for me, a lot that was helpful and I guess kind of going back to what I said before is, you know, tennis is that sport of I need to invite somebody to play with me. Um, and I think about, again, how I got started is I was, you know, say you could say pushed or encouraged by my mother. <laughs> to go knock on the ladies, you know, the neighbor's door. Um, and, and Dana knows my mom, so she can believe that <laughs> that's exactly what happened. But I knocked on the lady's door and she answered and then she took the time to lead me, you know, and to teach me and to inspire me and motivate me and kind of show me like, hey, here's what the path looks like. And here's, um, you know, what I can do to help you and to introduce you to more people. Um, at the same time, I did have guys that said, hey, come run with us as well. Oh, yeah. And that was mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, motivating. And, uh, you know, some of them were bigger, faster and stronger. And they pulled me along to do even better. And that made me feel confident and prepared. Um, but, you know, I think that in, in terms of, you know, women and the opportunities that they have, I, I honestly feel like I had great opportunities growing up. Uh, I did, I did, though, have a really cool 
opportunity when I got to college is when they started women's steeplechase for track and field. And so that's about a two mile race that had never been available for women before I got mm -hmm. to college. Um, so, you know, there was the motivation of the first time you go out and run the race, you're going to set the school record uh, because it's <laughs> never been done before. But to be on the, you know, the starting line, the finish line, but the like, you know, that that edge of like seeing and being part of like a women's emergence um, of just like, well, yeah, of course, women can do this. Like, why haven't we gotten to do this before? Why has this event been held back? Um, kind of opened my eyes and let me see like, all right, well, you know, there aren't necessarily always equal opportunities or there haven't been. Um, but, you know, my my responsibility, I think, just as a business leader, whether I'm a female or a male, is to be fully prepared and to be confident when I, you know, step on the starting line or when I, you know, walk into the office or I step into the boardroom. Um, and so, you know, that's something that sports largely taught me is prepare, prepare, prepare um, so that when it's time to perform, I'm ready to go. And I, again, appreciate the people that kind of led the way um, and gave me opportunities. But I think it's, you know, always just kind of comes back to, did you do that preparation? Um, so then I feel confident to per perform. It's another great lesson that sports teaches yeah. you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I want to talk about coaching. You know, this is a topic that uh, both of our organizations, I think, have dedicated a lot of time and, and attention to. Um, we know that women only account for about a quarter of the tennis coaches in our ecosystem. Dana's heard me talk about this as a young girl. All of my coaches were women, and I thought that was normal. And it wasn't until I came to work at USDA Florida that I realized that wasn't definitely not normal. Yeah, no um, way. <laughs> and so I, I, it was just, there was nobody that said, oh, that's weird. Or like, wow, how lucky are you? I just thought that's how it worked. And that's not how it works. <laughs> so Mason, my question for you is um, the Positive Coaching Alliance really is dedicated to providing that more positive coaching environment for young people and is working actively to make sports more inclusive. In your view, what impact does it have on young people, both boys and girls, to have a woman as a coach? Yeah, I think, um, so I, I mostly had all male coaches growing up. Um, it wasn't, I think, really until my senior year of high school that I had a female coach. And she kind of brought, Tracy Kuhn brought this renewed just joy to the sport. And really we had a hundred girls on our cross country team. You can imagine 115 to 18 year old girls might not all be exact like best friends, <laughs> um, but she taught us how to be best teammates. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was um, something that, you know, I've carried with me you know, for, for all of the years moving forward is we don't have to be kind of exactly side by side aligned, but if we can kind of be working towards the same goals uh, together, we can do great stuff. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, if we're talking about women here and we are, uh, they are great teachers um, and coaching is teaching. Um, and so I certainly, you know, believe that women can be fantastic in that role. Um, you know, but sometimes women are a little bit more hesitant to say, yeah, I'll go do that, um, having never done it before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, PCA, we do provide opportunities and, and help coaches be better coaches. You know, we teach tips and tools um, and help provide them resources. Um, so, you know, we would love to see more women participating in some of those workshops so that they do feel uh, prepared and confident. Um, but you know, to have a, to have a woman coach teacher is certainly like we said before, it's, it's inspiring. Um, you know, and I think whether you're a male or a female to have somebody that is leading you, um, that is motivating, that is, you know, caring for you, that is teaching you, uh, does go a long way. Excellent. I have a follow-up question for you, Dana. Um, so 
I know at USTA Florida, we are looking to provide more opportunities for girls to engage with our all-girl tennis camps and other events where we intentionally have women coaches teaching them. Why do you think it's important for us to do that? Well, uh, for me, and I'm, I think probably for you too, Laura, it goes back to um, the all-girls camp that we put on last year to celebrate Title IX. I mean, that was an event that quickly came together. It came together with partnerships, just like being here today with PCA. I think the partnerships are so important. And again, I'll continue to thank Catherine Dunnigan, the coach at UNF, her team. Um, I'm trying to think of the, uh, what was the other organization that helped? UTR. UTR. UTR helped. I mm-hmm. always say it's alphabet soup, but I can't keep all the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> so that particular day, what continues to come back to me is, um, as you know, it was a rainy day. We had a panel of these fabulous women leaders in the sport and really had no idea how the day would unfold. And probably the story that sticks out to me the most was a young girl after the panel had shared their uh road to where they were. One of them manages the national campus. Another one had played at, you know, all four grand slams. You had Catherine Dunnigan and her co- her path to be a college coach. Um, you had me just standing on the sidelines. But um, anyway, this one young girl shared that she did not have anything, quote unquote, against her coach. She and her brother were coached by the same tennis coach, a male. And after hearing the panel and some of the other discussions, she opened up and she said, I realize now why my brother seems more excited and more engaged with the coach than she was. And it was just very interesting. She was saying it innocently, sincerely, again, absolutely no negative about the coach other than the fact that the camaraderie between her brother and that coach was a lot more than what hers was feeling valued making a connection and for us as an organization and I'm so thankful you know you and I could be there together that we walked away having no idea how the day was going to go having in our mind we think there is a need out there and hearing those young players talk, and it was ages from six to 18, that we went, we don't know how we're going to do this, and we don't know what all's involved, but clearly there's a need. And so um, for me, that that's what is making us then take these extra steps and that it is important. You're talking about a whole group um, who is who is looking or a female coach. I think what's so great about you sharing that, Dana, what was great about that day is exactly the story you shared. I don't think any of us knew the value of it until we were in there, including the girls. So sometimes this question comes up, it's like, you're promoting this all women's or an all girls thing. Like, are you going to be able to get people there? Like, do they really want this? And sometimes I don't even think we know until we get in the room and it was just this magical experience where it's like yeah this is something I've never experienced before and it's actually pretty it's it's pretty cool and I I'd like to do it again so thank you so much for sharing that example because it's the one that sticks out in my mind too of the many magical things that happen that day yes So, Mason, you mentioned earlier in your answer about the tools that you all provide. Um, Could you talk a little bit about the tools and training that Positive Coaching Alliance provides to help women and and men who maybe have never coached a sport before? And then maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what other resources you have to help all coaches provide a more inclusive and positive environment. Yeah, sure. Um... We provide, as I was mentioning earlier, just our foundational workshop, and we've got a number of workshops, but just, you know, for the sake of this podcast and your question, Laura, um, our foundational workshop, it's what we call double goal coach workshop. And so that double goal is teaching kids to strive to win because winning is fun. It's important. 
Um, you know, we're doing the sport, we're competitive. So striving to win and then also teaching life lessons. And those workshops are facilitated by trainers. Um, our trainers are a wonderful group of individuals. And actually we uh, just recently brought on a new trainer. Her name is Lauren and she is, uh, I met her at St. Pete Racquet Club. Um, and so she is a tennis instructor there. Um, but, you know, there's three main principles that we discuss in that workshop. The first one is filling emotional tanks and realizing just, you know, your presence and how you're interacting with somebody else. You can make them feel, you know, better or worse by your words and your actions. Um, and then same for yourself. And so just how are you approaching your practice uh, or your competition? Um, that's the first principle. The second one is what's called the Elm Tree of Mastery. And so ELM stands for effort, learning, and mistakes. The idea of bouncing back from mistakes, uh, probably very important um, mm -hmm. as well in tennis. Um, but then that idea of mastery is just progress. I think everybody is motivated by progress. We want to see ourselves, you know, our teams, our organizations, you know, improving and progressing. I mean, youth are hungry to get better. You know, a lot of people, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the best at this sport. You hear that out of a lot of kids and I know everything there is to know, but really um, they get impressed when they see somebody doing it at another level, perhaps a little bit intimidated, but we talk about progress. Um, and then the third, um, you know, main principle in that workshop is respect for what's called roots. And so that's the idea or the acronym for respecting the rules, opponents, officials, teammates, and yourself, and realizing, you know, the, you don't need to hate the person that's across um, the net from you. That's not your enemy. While that is your opponent, you couldn't play the game without them. And, you know, a worthy opponent, opponent is going to make you better. Um, and really, they're out there trying to do the same thing as you are. They're very similar to you. Um, but so filling emotional tanks, the elm tree of mastery, and then talking about roots, the rules, opponents, officials, teammates, and self. That's kind of the basis of that foundational workshop. But like I said, youth are, uh, they're hungry to progress and coaches are teachers that are creating relationships. Um, and, you know, having that double goal of strive to win and teach life lessons. So that's kind of where we start. Um, but through Positive Coaching Alliance and, you did introduce me as the executive director here in Tampa Bay. Um, we are a national organization as well. Um, so there's, you know, opportunities all across the U.S. to get involved with our organization. Here in Tampa Bay, we do some more deep dives with teams and with coaches. Um, but, you know, it's really our trainers are connecting with teams and individuals and coaches and, you know, even taking a little bit of a customized approach to help them figure out what's best. And we figure, we, you know, take the time to figure out which one of our trainers is going to be the best with mm -hmm. and for your organization. And so maybe, you know, is it, is it a female? Is it a guy? Is it somebody, you know, that is, uh, you know, was a college athlete? Is it somebody, if we're working with youth, that's maybe a little bit more, you know, kind of able to talk on their level. So um, we, we do, we try to really connect with our partners um, and support them all the way through the season and just season after season as well. Cause the goal is, you know, you want that kid to go back to practice the next day. You know, you want that kid tugging on their parent or guardian and saying, you know, register me again. I want to, I want to I wanna play again next season. And um, you know, I did just renew my membership with USTA. So you know, I'm, a, I'm one of those people that's registering again myself. So walk the walk and you know, serve and serve, whatever you guys say. I'm not sure. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting because all of these things that mm -hmm. you talked about, I mean, sitting there and I'm thinking about the things I learned as a, as a young woman playing sports. And those were all the things that my coaches instilled in me. I mean, they, that was an incredible experience that again, I thought was super normal and definitely mm -hmm. was not. Um, but I also love that sometimes uh, on our side of, of things in our industry, we, we focus so much on the skills, like teaching the skills, right? But we lose a lot of that 
these things that you're talking about here and and sort of the emotional component and and the respect and the teamwork and the progress and uh, a lot of things you're talking about came up in a podcast we did with Larry Lauer um which was about this the psychology and and the emotional aspect of sport and again I think that's lost so much um so I love that these tools and resources are there and you know thank you so much for doing what you do um and, you know, hopefully we can do some more things together, which would be. Yeah, wonderful. absolutely. And we we are careful. Right. And and we do not step on the coach's toes. Right. We you know, I know it's really important. Let the coach coach, let the parent be the parent, you know, and let the athlete play and let the coach really focus on the X's and O's. We're not, you know, necessarily out there at the practice and uh, messing with any coaches X's and O's. Um, we are you know, reflecting and spending time maybe preseason or during the season to talk about the things, you know, because we want you to be fantastic on the court, but also off of the court. And so how can you carry the life lessons that you're learning on the court, you know, back into your your home life, your work life, you know, later down um, in your career and just even into your community. Um, but yeah, we uh, we love what we do. Um, and you know, the reason we do is we see the impact that it does make. Well, we love what you do too. So please yeah. keep doing it. <laughs> so Dana, in addition to coaching, which I know we could probably do an hour just on that topic alone, um, what other areas of tennis is USTA Florida working on to help identify ways that we can bring more women in and help them be successful? And as a follow-up to that, I know earlier you said I was just there at this panel standing on the side. No, that was not true. You are actually there because, you know, we do think it's important for women to see themselves in all areas. So how important is it for women to actually see other women <laughs> at these high levels of leadership in our business? So not just the coaching side or on the court playing the game, but the the business side. So I know that's too really deep questions. So I'll let you tackle them. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I just want to say what PCA is doing is amazing. And everything that you just shared, I share with parents on, when I'm talking to them about their grievances that my daughter's first five to 10 girls that she invited to her wedding were her opponents from junior tennis. So it can be done. Uh -huh. um, so, that, you know, but uh, I, I got off topic, but I always like to share that uh, with the parents. So in terms of what we're doing outside of the coaching and the players, you know, I look at our volunteer space and um, for instance, our board, we have three women on the board and I'm one of them. Sign up, please. Um, you know, that's that's something that we try to encourage and we're making it easier and easier by posting it, you know, when it comes out and it's time. And another thing that I love that the organization does that I wish I'd had an opportunity to do is the Leadership Academy. I cannot tell people the skill sets that that teaches. I mean, I've attended some of them myself, how to run a meeting, how to chair a meeting. Trust me, when I was president, I had to buy Robert's Rules for Dummies. I had no clue. Um, <laughs> So, and believe me, the whole board had to suffer through it with me. But uh, but that aside, that again, we're trying to give opportunities for, uh, you know, men and women. But again, we're talking about uh, the female space that that the Leadership Academy, I'm I'm begging people to look at that and and sign up for it. Um, the other thing that we do periodically when we know about it is to share job opportunities. Um, we've had opportunities where we've heard about, you know, a uh, tennis director space or a coaching space, and, and we've reached out to try and get the word out to other women that this position is available, because what we're finding is we're shocked at how many qualified, fabulous women are not applying for these positions. And again, I know I've heard Laura share with people at conferences. She's more than happy to help with resumes. I've said the same thing, uh, you know, do a mock interview. My dad used to do them with me. So, you know, there, there are other things that we can do to help. And, and part of it too, just comes down to being encouraging, 
and sharing your story. I think it is so important when you talk about women in leadership. Yes, this is not a Instagram snapshot <laughs> that, uh, you know, I have this gray hair and somehow arrived here. Um, there's there's stories of failure. There are stories of a turn in the road that I didn't see. Um, that speed bump that you had to get over, you know, uh, having to hit reset, that it might be a great path, but you needed to take a step back. And so I think that is a place where women in leadership, please share your story because it can really have an impact on uh, your audience. It may be an audience of one, it could be an audience of a hundred, who knows. But I think too that that is a skill set that we have of being able to tell the story and tell it with honesty and integrity um, of what your path was. And we saw proof of that at the girls camp. That's why those girls started opening up because they heard those women's authentic stories. Um, so I, I think those are important things that we that we can do as women in leadership. And then again, like I said, the last thing I'm going to tout it again, the research project that we're starting, I, I think is going to be a real tool that we can use, that we can share with PCA, that we can share with other organizations, because we all may think we know what the problem is or how to fix it. But again, we've realized uh, Laura and I, through different speaking engagements that we've done, that where I thought I was going to walk away with a ton of information about why is this happening? Why is it only a quarter of, you know, in the coaching field, whatever, in leadership roles? And I walked away not having the answers. And that's why we said, yes, we definitely, you know, have to put our money where our mouth is and, and dig deeper. Awesome. Mason, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, Dana, I think it's a really good point on the stories. Like I could tell you, there's a lot of people out there, you know, I don't know. And then you hear the story and I'm like, wow, I immediately like that person. Mm -hmm. um, there's never been somebody that's told their story where I'm like, nah, I didn't want to hear that. You know, that's, <laughs> that, that does me no good. Um, I, I love knowing and hearing. So I, yeah, I, I appreciate you making that point. I agree. And, you know, we, we are really um, hungry for uh, for people of all walks of life to share their story. And and Dana said, you know, it be a safe psychological space to say, tell us about like your failures and the things that didn't go well and the things you struggled with. Because I do think there's somehow this image of, well, to be a successful leader, it just magically happens and you get there and it's easy and you have some secret sauce that I don't. And the the truth is, and the more we've talked about this with other women. Everyone from Mary Carrillo to um, some of the professional players sharing that we find that, oh, wow, that person is now human to me and mm -hmm. I really like them and that's meaningful and that's some really good, um, some good stuff there that inspires me to, to stay in it, right? So I, I might be ready to give up, but, you know, stay in it because that person stayed in it and uh, they had the same struggle I did. So um so happy, Dana, that you shared that and that's actually a really good segue to my last question. Um, it's like you knew. <laughs> I wanted to ask. <laughs> so as women leaders in our sport or in sport in general, what advice would each of you give to women out there who may be right now struggling to find their place or their path to success? And this might be the same thing or something different. What was the best advice you ever received in your life or career? And so, Mason, I'll start with you. Um, okay, yeah. Um, you know, I um lot lot packed in there, Laura, on that question. <laughs> but uh you know, I think um for I, well, again, what Dana said a minute ago is still kind of hitting on me a little bit. You know, she talked about that idea of like reset or there might be like, you might think you're going down one path, but then you switch and you go another way. Um, and I think that that's important. You know, as you share a story, you learn that, oh, that person in that position didn't just go from A to B to C to D. And it's just this really straight line. And so we're all going to at some point probably have 
some sort of uh, you know fork in the road or you know think we're going on one path and then switch over to another and you know similar even for myself uh, I coached college cross country track and field men's and women's programs for about 12 years um, and then now you know I'm, I'm working at a nonprofit still working in the sports um, you know in team space but definitely you know took a jump um, from the career path that I was on to be where I am now but you know career career advice and life advice and, um, you know, what's really helped me uh, besides like move your feet, more top spin, get your racket back is, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, the, the first kind of phrase that comes, comes to my mind is bring others along. Um, you know, somebody, it was something that I felt and it was an idea that I had for many years, but she actually kind of coined that you know, specific phrase. And I think it's really important. And as I look back on, you know, the career I've had so far, um, when I was focused on bringing others along, I found myself doing probably my best as well. Um, and it was more fun and I was more successful um, when I focused on that idea of bring others along. But, you know, I think, uh, you know, kind of touched on this a little bit earlier as well is be clear in what you want and speak up about it. Um, you know, and when I was 10, I was clear about what I want and I knocked on the lady's door and I spoke up about it. And I, you know, that's what put me in a position then to get started and running and led into a very long career. Um, and then be able to answer questions on the spot. Right. So I think as business leaders, um, if somebody says, you know, what's your annual revenue, how many volunteers did you have? How many donors were at the, you got to be able to know those things and answer on the spot rather than like, I'll get back to you, you know? Um, and so really knowing your business um, and knowing the details is incredibly valuable, but yeah, to go back to it, I would say, uh, you know, the best and kind of driving piece for me is bring others along. Love it. Such good advice. All right, Dana, your turn. <laughs> what advice would you give to the women out there? And what's the best advice you ever received? Um, in terms of the, the women out there, and you had used the word struggling, and mm -hmm. I wish somebody had given me this advice when I was, that, you know, don't panic. Mm -hmm. and, and that, hey, the course that you're on, just because, it, again, it may not be going as you thought, and I think that's where tennis does teach you, you know, everything doesn't always go your way on the court. And, and so we certainly know it doesn't happen in life, but don't panic. And I liked what um, Mason shared about asking that mm -hmm. I think sometimes to me, the word, you know, being a mentor can be intimidating somewhat. It sounds like a lifelong commitment. And like when Mason was saying, you know, just ask being a mentor could be, uh, you know, sitting down and having a cup of coffee with someone, yeah. just talking to them about a particular issue right then. And mm -hmm. so I don't, would encourage women, um, if they do feel like they're struggling, like Mason said, speak up. There is going to be someone there who can help you. And again, it may just be over lunch with me, probably a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I think that that is good advice. Um, and in terms of the best advice I've gotten, I, thankfully I've gotten a lot. I will have to say the first one that came to mind was when my mother told me, don't marry a man who looks in the mirror longer than you do. And um, <laughs> true, think about it. Uh, but the also really good advice, and I, I've shared it with Laura and it's really been hitting home a lot, um, is never stop learning because Never stop learning to me says, uh, be willing to take some risk. Don't have a fear of failure. Don't stop asking questions. You need to be flexible because I'm someone who can get very stuck in their ways and think that she is exactly right. And <laughs> someone who does know better than me um, that they're going to teach me something and I need to be flexible about that to, to number one, to hear it, to listen. And, and so for me, that's really been amazing advice because there have been things through my career, even later in life, just as much as early on, that I might have had some fear 
and stepping into that position um, or volunteering for that position because I didn't know everything. Well, guess what? You're never going to learn it if you don't step into that position. So other than the looking in the mirror advice, I would say <laughs> mine has been never stop learning. I love that. Um, the best advice I ever heard, and I, I like to throw this out there for people who haven't heard this before. I, I do believe it was on a, a happy hour with Mary Carrillo. <laughs> and she was talking about how she wanted to quit being a broadcaster when she first started because she felt she was terrible about at it. She was getting criticized. and um, And I remember being on this podcast or this happy hour, and she said the best advice she got was from a colleague who said, stay in the room. And it hit me, that moment hit me so definitively. And as I've watched women leave rooms because they've gotten frustrated or they felt they weren't being heard and they say, well, I'm not valued here. I'm going to walk out of the room. It's like, that was, it was something I had never thought about before. And that now I think about it all the time. And if I could just say one thing in terms of the women who are listening that maybe are frustrated or have been in rooms where they weren't chosen or they weren't picked or they weren't listened to is stay in the room, like stay in that room and keep speaking, keep saying like, because we need you in the room. We need more of you in the room. So hopefully that hits somebody um, just like Mason, bring, bring others along with you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we we need all the the good advice and experiences that um that you all have shared and i want to thank you i know we're out of time today you all have been so gracious with your time and your advice and your guidance and dana you've been such a great guide for me and a great example and i i just love and appreciate that so very much i can't wait to see what we do next and mason i i can't wait to see what we're able to do uh together so thank you both for joining me today and for all you do yeah, thanks, Laura. Good seeing you again, Dana. Good to see you. For those of you who are listening to the audio-only version of this podcast, be sure to hop on over to USTA Florida's YouTube channel where you can check out the full video version. And of course, for all episodes of the Here to Serve podcast, including upcoming topics, guests, and dates, visit ustaflorida.com slash here to serve. Thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful rest of your day.